Um, my name is Tracy Inman, and I am from the United States, from Kentucky. And just as she, uh, that group hoped to inspire you to do some research in your own classrooms, um, I hope to inspire you to remember why you do what you do every day. We have been in a pretty rough place these past few years. We have, um, the pandemic has led to isolation. Uh, I mean, it's so much more than, than just the pandemic. We are in a time of division and strife and uh, unanswered questions and um, our world, I think, is in a pretty tough place. And as educators especially, we have felt the brunt of trying to get our children not just through this, but to grow as, as we go along with the pandemic. And so I think it's been very challenging um, to try to not only just teach them reading and writing and arithmetic, but to try to make sure they're navigating these waters in a healthy way. So I'm going to focus on joy and try to remind you of why you're doing what you're doing. You'll see here that there's a Padlet um, address, and so if you're interested in any of these stories, this whole slideshow is, is on the Padlet. Now, I will tell you that I've written these down. Um, I am going to read them, but I know as uh, some of you are non-native English speakers, it may be easier for you to read in, instead of listen. So this is kind of my inspiration. So I'm going to call you to task. I, I won't call on you necessarily, so don't worry about that. But I, I want you to start thinking about who you are, what your role is in education, the experiences you've had. And to start us off, we're going to share a story by Wendy Behrens. And Wendy's actually here. She's doing another session. Um, and you can see a little bit about Wendy. If you want to know more about her, I can fill you in on that as well. But Wendy's story of joy is about Kai. And she calls it, What We Say Matters. Kai sat near the door, as if he might need a quick escape. He waited nervously for math team practice to begin. A head taller than most, he wore his hair neatly braided and clothes that were clean but well-worn. I startled him saying, Kai, I am glad you came today. When we divided into smaller practice teams, he looked at me as if to say, I can't do this. Kai's team won the competition that day, earning suckers as trophies. Kai stayed in the room after practice. Staring at his sucker, he said to me, I've never won a prize in school before. I really can do math, can't I? I followed my, by saying, of course you can. And so he did. After experiencing success, Kai discovered a love for learning. His attendance and grades improved overall. He'd stop by my office to say hello, share a joke, or tell me something he found interesting. I lost track of Kai that fall when he entered middle school. Years later, standing in line at the grocery store, I heard someone say, see that lady? She told daddy he was good at math. I turned to see Kai holding a hand of a little boy. His hair was still braided, now with pressed clothes, wearing a collared shirt and tie. I later learned he became a math instructor at our local technical college. For Kai and for me, words made all the difference. Close your eyes for a moment, and I want you to think about a time that words made all the difference for you. Whether you're a student, perhaps something a teacher said to you, or as a teacher, something a student said to you. I wish you could see what I see. Very soft expressions, smiles on faces. Hopefully we all have had that experience where that true communication really matters. When I ask teachers, educators, psychologists, uh, university professors, researchers, when I ask these folks across the United States to share their stories of joy, they came through in abundance. One of my favorite ones was by Jaime Castellano, and he focuses on um, 
multi-exceptional learners, specifically uh, children learning English. I first met Lucas when he was a three-year-old Spanish-speaking immigrant from Venezuela. His parents enrolled him in our Federal Head Start program. In the beginning, he would yell, scream, kit, hit, kick, and attempt to run away as his parents walked him to his classroom. There were many days when I had to literally peel Lucas off his mother's leg. Eventually, though, he settled in and would greet me each day with a hug and a smile. One year later, Lucas was leading circle time, reading books in English to his classmates, and devouring all the content his Head Start teachers provided. During his kindergarten year in his local public school, Lucas was tested for gifted education services. He was assessed by a bilingual psychologist that surprisingly Lucas himself requested, and he surpassed all the scores needed for eligibility. He's flourishing in his gifted education program and looks forward to what the future may bring. This is a story that brings me joy and puts a smile on my face. Si, si pueda. Yes, we can. Do you know a child like Lucas? Very unsure, terrified, clinging to his mother's leg, that within just a short time period, he's advocating for himself because he was given the confidence shown that he can do things. This comes from Joy Lawson Davis. Um, she's an expert in the field, uh, in particular in equity of access and opportunities. She called her piece, Full Circle Joy, Intergenerational Impact of Equity and Access. Just last fall, I conducted a parent workshop for one of our nation's premier institutions, talent development programs. During the question and answer segment at the end of the workshop, a parent spoke up and noted how excited he was to learn from my wisdom during the session, for he had known me for many years. First as an at-risk student in a special enrichment program many years ago, and now as a parent. This young man later revealed that I was one of a team of educators that he believed were responsible for the trajectory of his life and for his current day success. He was humble, but proud to share that without the special program, he doubted that he would be where he is today. The program, he acknowledged, provided the equitable resources, challenging instruction, and support that he needed at a critical time in his life. His participation in the program from his middle school years through high school provided an entry to higher education and a world that students like him would never have participated in. It was the opening of the doors of this program that enabled him to access just the tools he needed to become the highly successful businessman in Fortune 500 companies and now be in a position at one of the nation's most prestigious institutions of higher education. Hearing his voice and listening to his story on that afternoon brought me such sheer joy and reminded me of the priceless value of the work that I've devoted my life to for so many years. Now, he acknowledged, I was reaching into his home with my words of wisdom and helping him again, but this time as a parent of a highly gifted black male child who's too often overlooked and underestimated in his daily schooling experience. After that evening, I had to take a pause, and I want you to take a pause right now too and think about this. I remembered all of the many programs, the students, the parents, the families, the educators who I had interacted with from communities across the nation. The work came alive that evening. Our encounter rejuvenated me. His voice of gratitude made my heart swell with joy. Like so many of you, I see so, so much tragedy and loss in our world, but hearing stories like this one encouraged me to believe again that sometimes it only takes one action to cause a ripple effect that can impact lives across generations. Therefore, we must continue with our efforts to bring equity to all communities we seek out gifted students across the nation, as we seek out gifted students across the nation and world. The right action can create impact intergenerationally and an incomparable joy that may last forever. Now I'm gonna ask for a volunteer this time. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Think about a time that a student contacted you years later to let you know 
what an impact you made. Or perhaps you ran across um, his mother or, or somebody that knew him and, and caught you up with what was going on in that life. Would anyone like to share a story? A time that it made impact? Yes, I'm going to come down and let you um, say this into the microphone if that's okay. I hope that doesn't change your mind. Good. You never can tell. No problem. Just 10 minutes ago, we were outside and a mother came to me and talked to me about um, the intervention I did for her daughter. And she's on a complete new school now and doing better and better than the two years she was on the former school. So it's when you ask this, I only have to think about 10 minutes ago. That's beautiful. I start to get goosebumps with this. And we're not in it for this reason, but it's so nice to know that what we do matters, right? And that gets you through many hard times. One more story before I share one from the group. Yes. Um, I had a woman coming up to me in the grocery store. No, she was following me and I was like, yeah, I know you too. You're the mother from so-and-so. Yeah, and I thought, yeah, but I, I, um, I helped him like 15 years ago. So uh, I was like, yeah, I felt um, I didn't want to like approach her. So, but then she bumped my car into her car. And she said, do you know who I am? And I said, yes. And she said, you made such a difference. And I thought it was so small. Because I thought it was about um, him not being um, party trained. <laughs> Okay. But she said, you did so much more. And you know what? He wants to be a teacher now, too. So he was studying to be a teacher for the special needed. I was like, oh, I'm happy. you made my day. That's beautiful, yes. Uh, and we need to serve as mentors for those young folks, don't we? I saw your hand, too. I'll, if it's okay, I'll actually just read a little bit of an email that I got two months ago. It's, it's yeah. short. Um, hi Orla, every once in a while I get the urge to email you and let you know how much the atmosphere you fostered in CTYI affected me. Uh, we had very few direct interactions, most of them were you giving out to me because I did something stupid or deeply inappropriate and wrong, but that's part of it. The culture you fostered in CTYI was so accepting that I felt comfortable enough that I could make mistakes and grow. I, like a lot of CTYI kids, am autistic, which means much of my life I had been met with the frustration of adults who didn't understand why I just didn't understand things, but I never felt that at CTYI. A year or two ago I came out as transgender and I knew exactly who I could tell and who would accept me because I knew they went to CTYI and you can't survive that place as a bigot. You gave people a place to honestly, completely be themselves. When someone does that, it's impossible to leave that place thinking it's a bad thing. The world is getting scarier for minorities of all stripes, but I want you to know that you are making an active difference in making people more comfortable. Without you, I probably wouldn't be the woman I am today. I'd probably still be a hateful little boy. I'm sure I'm not the only one that cannot speak on others' behalf, but thank you. Oh, wow. I, um, I have a transgendered nephew, so that really hit home for me. Let's hear about Seth. You mentioned community, and it's so important. Um, this comes from Debbie Daly. She's from Arkansas in the United States. When I began teaching in Gifted and Talented program nearly 20 years ago, I had a young boy in my class who was very shy and somewhat withdrawn. Seth's home life was different from other boys his age. He lived with his two moms in a small town where this was an anomaly. And Seth was often identified as the boy with two moms. Seth's class met 150 minutes each week with a small group of identified gifted and talented students. Students participated in various curriculum projects, including individual and group research activities, stock market research and games, inquiry-based science units, and various field trips. Seth was in my GT class for four consecutive years. And through that time, Seth became more outspoken, enjoyed digging into cultural projects, and made many new friends. I will never forget his two moms coming to a parent-teacher conference and telling me that the GT program changed Seth's life. Last I, oh, he was now eager to go to school, be with his friends, and learn new things. Last I heard, Seth was excelling in a graduate program at Florida State University. The GT program may have changed Seth, but it was Seth who changed me. 
at that point, I realized the power of community on a shy boy with few friends. I saw how the excitement of learning is enhanced with experiences and interest-based choices. I learned how vital gifted and talented programs are to the whole child. Think of a time when you felt community. I don't know about you guys, but this is one place I feel community. We're in so, you know, we're, we're so alone oftentimes in our own districts or states, provinces, countries, that it's so wonderful to be with folks who get us. Can you think of a time perhaps when you provided a community for someone? The camp that you were just mentioning, Orla, certainly did, that program. I hope that the program the youth are participating in now is going to be one of those. This one comes from Vicki Cooper, and she is a, a teacher in a very rural district. One afternoon, I was reading through essays. A student asked me to rise for his application to a prestigious alternative high school. My eyes filled with tears while reading the one about overcoming adversity. He shared his experience of not fitting in at his new school and the agony it brought him. He wrote about his first day coming to my gifted class. Everyone was like me. Even the teacher was weird, but, but in a good way. That class saved my life. He explained the impact my class had made on his life. Don't discount your ability to make a difference. When have you made a difference? Who wants to share? Uh, last year I was working with a, um, a tiny boy who was very scared. He was dropped out of school uh, and even on, in the place we were uh, providing uh, for them. Um, it, it didn't work out. And then uh, I asked his mother on what kind of things he did at home. He was afraid there too. He, he's, he's, he's also, there are very many things uh, bothering him. Uh, and I found out that he uh, um, liked carpenting. And I said, well, shall we make an, uh, a flower uh, thing for your, for your mother uh, for, for in the garden? Uh, and he started to cry and he said, uh, we don't have the money for the wood. And I said, well, I'm a daughter of a carpenter, so we, I will provide the wood. And he had just such a good time, so I saw uh, well, something else. And from then he came in with a smile uh, again in school. Uh, and still there's, we have a lot of things, but, but the beginning is there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And it is the beginning. What you say and do matters. It matters greatly to people. And they remember it years and years and years later, don't they? Um, I remember running into Chris. He was one of my former students. He was now like 40 years old and a, and a lawyer in town. And after we hugged and, and you know, we kind of caught up with each other, he said, oh, oh, I want to show you something. And he reaches in his wallet and pulls out a piece of paper that was notebook paper, kind of torn. And I could see when he held it up that it had my handwriting on it. And I'm thinking, oh, dear God, what did I write on that piece of paper? Because, you, you, know, you know, when you're grading lots of things. And luckily, he said, I just want you to know I still keep this. And it said, come on, Chris, we both know you can do better than this. Thank God it was something like that instead of the bomb that my calculus teacher drew on my paper once. You know, the bomb with the little fizzle stick, right? We remember those things. So it doesn't take very much to, to literally change a life, connecting with somebody, right? Um, the, this is interesting, too. He's going to share, Justin Moreshi is a teacher in Louisville, Kentucky, and he's going to share the first time he saw giftedness at work. I always offer opportunities for independent practice. Years ago, after a teaching a unit on electromagnetism, a student asked me if she was allowed to make electromagnetic shoes for her independent project. Okay, so shoes that are picking up metal stuff, right? Initially, she'd hoped she would be able to walk up a steel I-beam. <laughs> now think about that. On the wall, she wants to walk. Hey, great ideas, right? Um, 
but settled for picking up copious amounts of purposely sp spilled paper clips in her presentation of the class. Her electromagnetic shoes were expertly planned with independent switches for each foot attached to her belt for easy access. She presented her creation to the class by creating a man on the street style performance for her classmates. This was the first clear example of giftedness I remember witnessing in my classroom. Close your eyes. Think about the first time you witnessed giftedness in yourself, in your child, in a student in your classroom, a university student. I'd say there's a good chance that Justin had other gifted kids in his classroom. Um, he may have had the one who sits in the back and causes all the problems, right? We, we've all had experience with those kids because they're not being appropriately challenged. This sparked an interest in him, and he now has a specialist degree in gifted education because he was wondering who else is out there? Who, who can I help find and, um, and inspire, perhaps? Uh, this one's just from a very small town. I loved it. She's out in Montana, Tamara at Fisher Alley. Uh, Miss Fish, do I get a prize for solving this puzzle? Prove you solved it first. He lays the nine pieces on the table. It's solved, but I don't recognize the puzzle he's returning. I have puzzles like it, but this one isn't familiar. Yet there is GT in my handwriting written on the corner of the packaging. It dawns on me. His mother, one of my former students, checked out the puzzle almost two decades earlier and never returned it. Here was her son, a third grader, returning it. They'd solved it together, two prizes. For so many of us, these moments come from our, our children, our students, right, regardless of the age. But I also want you to think about the joy that you've experienced by professionals recognizing your work, um, seeing value in what you do. Julie Gann won the award for the National Association for Gifted Children's Gifted Coordinator Award, and so this is, is her story. The saying, hard work really does pay off, rings true in my current work. Over the past several years, I have worked tirelessly with my team to instill advocacy within our district advocacy that would ensure opportunity and access for each of our students. We have instilled this by building relationships with our faculty, district leaders, community partners. We have provided consistent procedures and communication to our stakeholders, training school level and district support staff on gifted education, and allowing for stakeholders to be part of this process has instituted an inclusive gifted educational system in our district. Creating partnerships and building relationships at each level of the educational world, I am now beginning to see the fruit of our labor. Classroom teachers are advocating, principals are advocating, and district level personnel are advocating for our gifted students to get the programming services they need on a daily basis. We still have a way to go, but to see the dismantling of the elitist stigma, albeit slowly, has been a great feeling. Cheryl McCullough from Virginia shares her story. As a new supervisor in a new school system, I had much to prove to my colleagues. I took a risk and asked a principal if I could take over three summer school classes. Hiring three phenomenal resource teachers for the gifted, they implemented gifted curriculum with scaffolding instead of using remediation strategies being used in other classes. At, and at, excuse me, after our last day, the supervisor of equity and excellence stopped me in the parking lot saying she was blown away by the culturally responsive pedagogy she saw in those classrooms and said we were the real deal. Does anyone want to share a professional story of joy? How many of you are making presentations today or during the conference? Celebrate that. That should be joyous. You've already put the work into it, right? It's already ready to go. 
enjoy that aspect of it. I think so often, you know, I, I don't know if you were in here with uh, Matt's last presentation talking about the imposter syndrome, but that is so true with, uh, I, I have found personally with, with many educators. And even notice with Julie Gann, she says, we, we, we. And it was a we, but there are some folks who wouldn't say that, right? We, we tend to, to do that sometimes. So think about the times that professionally you really did something great. Any sharers? See, you're too humble to do that, aren't you? It's like tooting your own horn and you're not going to do it. Okay, I hope that inside you are recognizing the fact that it was awesome. Like the three ladies who just went before me, you should be just floating out of here, feeling so good about yourselves. Because that's not an easy thing to do. And you're sharing such an important message. That's awesome. My friend Mary Kay Ritchie has written many books, and she's always been an original thinker. And when I asked her to share a story of joy, um, she said, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I kind of took that off the first part of this, where she said, I'm not going to do what you asked me to do. I'm sorry. But what I want to do is this. I challenge you to look at every child through a lens of potential. And she's speaking to each of you right now. Find the potential that a child holds within them instead of focusing on those things that may get in the way. Things that can negatively influence our thinking about a child's achievement include language, behaviors, socioeconomic status, race, and special needs. Remember that test scores and grades represent a moment in time, not the future that could be for the child. So many children are under-challenged we must commit to nurturing the potential in everyone. I would venture to say our young people sitting over here, some of you are probably under-challenged. Let's consider all the possibilities in the wonderful children and young people that surround us. Can we commit to doing that? Looking through the lens of potential? Maybe even the most, um, the kids who look like they don't have it at all, right? Those who are putting on strong acts. I think that's such a very important thing to do. And I'm also going to challenge you today to think about the differences you've made. I'm not saying you have to write articles about it or anything like that. I'm just saying, remember the joy that this brings you. The first time you recognized giftedness in somebody. The first time you saw eyes light up with a child that you took extra care and it didn't matter that he didn't have the money for it. You made it happen. Or the child who's now a transgender and, and that came a young person now because of the, the confidence that he got, she got now, right? She got as, um, through that camp experience. Remember the joy. This job is way too hard to not remember the joy and to celebrate it. I'm going to just end with my email. Um, if I can help in any way, please let me know. I am, you know, I think most of us here, this is all about networking and connecting, and we are one. We are just in this together, no matter where we're from. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>